Welcome to the Hot Sauce. This is Angel Plumel, a registered dietitian nutritionist in Seattle, Washington. I'm currently at 173 subscribers, and the goal is to make it to 250 by the end of the year. So please help a brother out and like, comment, and subscribe. You can also catch this, previous, and future episodes on your favorite podcasting platforms. Let's get right into it. Today, we are going to feature Linda Farr, a registered dietitian nutritionist that resides in Greensboro, Georgia, a small town about 30 minutes away from Athens, Georgia. All right, so welcome back to the Hot Sauce. Today, we have a good friend and fellow Academy member who has served as, a, I guess, you are past president. How many times removed now? One, two? Two, two times removed. Yeah, two years two out. Two times removed. Two times <laughs> removed. Okay. So this is Linda Farr. So we're going to put Linda in the hot seat here. And we're going to go ahead and ask her to tell us about her journey into the profession. What has inspired you to join the profession? If you want to go back and tell us where you went to school, where you did your internship and jobs along the way, we'd love to hear it. So the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Angel, for inviting me. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. And, you know, I can't think of a better name for a podcast than hot sauce because this Texas girl loves her hot sauce. And, you know, if, I think if we compare our profession to hot sauce, we know there's different intensities and different flavors and different recipes, and that's what our profession is. So um, congratulations on all you do for our profession. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, I grew up in Iowa City, Iowa, and I'm the daughter of a registered dietitian. And so when I began thinking about careers, which was in junior high school at the time, I thought about dietetics and I thought about being a flight attendant. And so those were my two things that I really wanted to do. But I, my first paper in junior high school was on anorexia nervosa. And that just fascinated me. And I may be very unique, but I fell in love with what I thought dietetics was, food and nutrition. I enjoyed a little bit of cooking as a kid. I felt like um, nutrition and dietetics would not only be a great career, but it would benefit me and my family personally as I grew and had a family. And so I set a beeline toward dietetics and I did it. I knew that's what I wanted. And I had no questions, no sidelines. I went straight to dietetics. So all through high school, I prepared myself like you do. Um, in college, I had a wonderful experience. It was um, in the summers. I would work at the University of Iowa, which is where my mother was a dietitian. And I, I worked, she ran a satellite hospital called Children's Hospital, which was actually a polio hospital in the um, way back before even when she was there. Um, and since then it's been torn down. But in the summers in high school, I would serve trays. I would work in the dish room, on the tray line, help make salads and that sort of thing. So I did that um, in the summers. And then the summer between, um, I guess it was at the end of my junior year, I did what you call an externship at the University of Iowa, where I spent the summer working with a pediatric dietitian. And what we focused on was what we call the constant carbohydrate diet, which is now carb counting. And that's what we did back there. So. Um, I learned the diabetic exchange list and had it memorized and was real experienced in that before I really had my clinical classes in college. And so I felt like I was very well prepared and my advice to any um, intern or student interested in dietetics is that I'm not sure if shadowing gives you enough experience. If you're going to do that, I would encourage you to really work in the field, wherever you want to work, whether it's food or a hospital or a nursing home or some other environment. I think actually getting in and working alongside of a dietitian or a dietetic technician registered, if that's your area of, of interest, um, that is very beneficial because I felt really prepared throughout my internship and throughout college. 
Awesome to hear. Awesome to hear. Yeah. Please so I, I attended Iowa State University and then the University of Iowa for my internship. And I interned in the 70s. And in the 70s, we were only allowed to um, select from two internships. And our advisors would tell us what two to apply to. We didn't have to pay to apply. And when we got the internship, we received, and I'm not sure if all internships at that time were the same. I think they might have been, but we received a stipend for our food and our lodging. So during my internship, I lived in the nurse's dorm at the University of Iowa, um, and it was connected to the university hospital through a tunnel because in the winter it got so cold. And so we would go to, to and from the university and we were expected to work what hours, whatever hours were required. It was not an eight to five job or a seven to three job or anything like that. We were at the whim of whatever was needed. So there were days when we were working into the evening, we were having to get real early. Um, we received no pay, um, but we had wonderful experience. We wore uniforms. It was a wonderful teaching experience in the teaching, a thousand bed medical center. So there were medical students, nurses. And another thing that's interesting about that time is that dietitians were paid a lot more than nurses. We were more highly educated than nurses. And at that point, nurses didn't even have a, a BS degree in order to practice. So nursing has progressed through the years, advancing their degree and expertise. So um, after I completed my internship, I um, was also enrolled. We were all required to be enrolled in the graduate program. So we were graduate students and interns. It was an eight month internship. And at the end of our internship, we graduated with 12 hours toward our master's degree. And most everyone that I interned with went on and got a public health master's degree. Um, my, I did not complete my master's and I have some perspective on that. I think if I would go back now and do it, I would want to get a master's in communications marketing and those sorts of things, because I think it would have really helped me in my private practice. Some of those things I had to teach myself. But the reason I didn't continue on with the master's is because at the time, um, my father was um, in the last stages of cancer. And my mother had to quit her job and stay home and care for him. So I actually had the opportunity to take over my mother's job at Children's Hospital and be the dietitian for all the people that I had worked with in high school. So it was a wonderful um, kind of a circle for me. And, and you know what, Angel, I started off really thinking I wanted to be a clinical dietitian. And I, I did a lot of clinical for the first two or three years of my job there at the University of Iowa. But I found a huge passion for the men and women in the food service department and all the things they had to learn and all the blood, sweat, and tears they put into preparing the food and being there on snowy days when nobody else could get to the hospital and being underappreciated by the rest of the hospital. So I felt my calling was being a hospital food service director. And that's what I, um, after I moved to Texas a couple years later, I was clinical um, and worked at Presbyterian Hospital for two or three years. And then a friend of mine left a job at a hundred bed small hospital in Mesquite, Texas. And that's where I really got to do what I loved, which was something I did at Children's Hospital. And that was be the clinical dietitian and the food service director. Mm -hmm. And what excites me about dietetics is, is helping people. And it's building teams and creating things. And being a food service director was what I loved so much. So I didn't get into dietetics because I love chemistry, because I hated it. 
I had a lot of trouble with it. I kind of related much better to um, um, the biochemistry because it was more related to nutrition. Um, I never liked having to do all the calculations, which I mean, I was able to do and it was fine, but it was connecting with the patients, connecting with families and all that sort of thing that continues to drive me today. So awesome. um, let's see. So I, I was a food service director in small hospitals in Mesquite, Texas for about six or seven years. And then one of my assistant administrators from that hospital was hired to open up a private mental health hospital. And it was called The Haven in a, a suburb of Texas. And she hired me before the hospital opened to be the food service director, the director of housekeeping and the director of purchasing. And I questioned myself a little bit, but was very excited about the opportunity. And I said, yes. And so I moved into this new role and quickly had to learn about housekeeping and realized it's not half as regulated as dietetics. Um, and if I knew about the you know, regulations and sanitation and safety of dietetics, I could run a housekeeping department and definitely purchasing. Um, we do purchasing all the time in, in our food service department. So um, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that I loved. And at the time, mental health was highly funded. And this was a private hospital where we dealt with eating disorders and we could keep um, those patients in the hospital for six months um, in order to really see them transition through the stages they needed. And we worked with um, um, psychologists, personal psychologists, psychiatrists. We had an art therapist, a music therapist. It was a wonderful, wonderful team in which I really learned a lot about eating disorders. Um, and throughout my career and in private practice, I felt very comfortable dealing with eating disorders as long as I knew my patients had a therapist. So that was kind of my experience. Um, after that job, I had an opportunity to move to a 500 bed med surge hospital. And that again was a wonderful challenge for me. I loved it. I, I being at that level, you have subordinates that do the purchasing and do the scheduling. And I was able to actually work on um, design of a new cafeteria. And we were in the midst of that when I decided to get married and my husband took a job in San Antonio. So I wasn't there as long as I wanted to be, but I moved to San Antonio and began looking for food service jobs. And all that were available at the time were food service jobs that were run by management companies. And so I would interview for a job here or there and it was always with a non-RD who would be above me and they would never offer me the salary I knew I deserved. And so at that point, I realized I am not going to be able to do this again. So I took six months, refreshed myself on clinical dietetics and moved into opening up my own private practice called Nutrition Associates of San Antonio. And Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I wanted to go into private practice. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you want me to tell you a little bit about my private yeah, practice? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and, yeah, okay. you go ahead and talk about that? I, and, I, and I will say, uh, as you continue, you clearly have taken a number of different jobs along the way. So you've you've showcased some uh, adaptability and skills along the way. So now continue. Right. And, and I would say for any, anyone entering this field, um, it's, it's such an awesome, wonderful field that adapts to whatever your life is. So wherever your profession may take you, wherever you live, whatever your interests are, whatever doors may open, you can always say yes. 
and you can adapt and have multiple job opportunities. So you can't always lay out a path and know exactly where you think you want to go because things are always changing in the field and your interests always change. So one of my pieces of advice that someone told me is always say yes first and then figure out how you're going to do it because the multiple skills that you have as a registered dietitian or a, a dietetic technician registered can be transferred in so many ways. Absolutely. So when I opened my private practice, it was one of the most fun things I think I'd ever done. I never worried about failure because I had operated large food service departments. I had budgeted. I had learned how to market the services of the hospital. I had collaborated with teams. I had um, all these challenges that I could relate to. And so I really never worried about failure. It was fun. I was able to create and not have to pass it by someone. And I knew that I had to manage my budget. So I did a lot of development of my own materials. And I did a lot of asking questions and networking with my academy friends and colleagues. And I have to say, I am a very proud member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And I credit it for a lot of my success throughout my career. I could not have done what I did without the, the support and the education, the lifelong learning, the evidence-based practice that I um, took advantage of through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So another piece of information I, or um, tip I would recommend highly recommend is that um, all, all people in this field should be members of the academy and not just take, but give back because we are only better with your involvement, your questions, your driving force for um, advocating for our profession, whether it's in Washington, DC, or whether it's advocating for people of your same specialty. So through all those skills, I was able to market my business. I was able to volunteer at the mayor's fitness council and get my business known. I was able to network with other dietitians who referred patients to me. I was able to um, work with interns and, and learn from them and help them build skills in private practice as well. So I spent the last 26 years in private practice. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience, even through COVID. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. No, it's um, it's always great to hear people's journeys, and and like I said, the the being the head of housekeeping and, and all these things sound it may say sound daunting, but you're absolutely correct in that. With all the skills and um, experience we gather throughout our profession we can step into a lot of different roles and have success anywhere. So we can. definitely a testament to you and what you've been doing. Thank you. And you know, you can, you can create jobs. So, you know, if the job isn't perfect for you, you can create it and you can go and make the case to your administrator or, or company or entity and make the case and show your evidence of what you've been able to do. And so the, the world is our oyster. We can really get out there and do a lot of unique and wonderful things. Well, thank you for sharing your experience. I appreciate, I appreciate what you just told us. So the next question for you is you, um, you know, you were, uh, or your, your presidency term started <laughs> at uh, essentially we're, we're in the middle of the pen or, or just started with the pandemic. Right. Uh, we have mm -hmm. all the, you know, all the turmoil happening in the world. Can you talk about your experience as president and how, um, or, or talk about your volunteering and what led up to the presidency and anything you want to share that? Uh, oh, great. You know. um, so I began volunteering for my dietetics profession when I first moved to Dallas and I volunteered at the district level 
eventually moved up to the state level. So I was president of the district and, and um, worked on the yearbook, which was our directory of names and started building friendships with my colleagues. And I think what happened is the more you learn about the district and the state, the more you learn about the academy and it's just kind of a stepping stone. And so I moved um, from being the academy pre or the um, Texas president and learning about lobbying efforts and licensure and the organization of, of the state affiliates. Then I became um, a delegate for Texas and I began learning more from other people around the country. That was a fantastic experience where you broaden your horizons and you understand and you get to meet people from around the country who all have so much in common. And I have to say, Acad the Academy um, and its members have become like family to me. Um, there, there are no borders within the Academy because we all are so much alike in so many ways and, and we're, we all have similar experiences um, in some ways. In other ways, they're very different and we grow because of our different experiences. So right, I was a right. delegate and then um, became speaker of the House of Delegates, which put me on the Academy Board of Directors. And that's a whole different perspective because now as an Academy board member, you're looking at the organization as a business entity. So we've got the membership, which is, you know, working with the affiliates and the delegates and that sort of thing and professional issues. And then we have the Academy board of directors, which manages the, the business the association. So we're worried about, we think about finances and our strategic plan and working with the CEO and visioning our future. So it was a shift for me to be able to understand that. But again, I could kind of relate to that because of being um, a department head through my years. And so mm -hmm. I was on, as speaker, I was on the Academy Board of Directors three years. And after that period of time, I, I was interested in being academy president and ran for academy or um, uh, tried to apply um, and for the nominating committee and was not selected. And eventually um, I did become academy president and it was such an honor. I, I really think, you know, COVID was a challenging time. I took over president at about June of the year COVID. We had COVID 2020. And so everything that we had been planning six months prior really changed. But I was, I was able to change and I was able to see and hear the needs of our members. And I feel like my calling was to hold us together as a profession and um, soothe everybody's emotions and listen. I mainly listened to everybody's concerns. And it was not just COVID, but it was the social unrest from the George Floyd incident, which moved into Black Lives Matter and so many other issues that we were dealing with at the time. Right. And I definitely did not um, have any of the expertise that I needed um, to handle it on my own. There was a a team effort from the Academy Board, the members, the Diversity and Equity Committee. And, and a lot of that was in the development stages. So it was, we were learning. I was still running a private practice. Um, the Academy CEO was still trying to coordinate with the staff to be sure that they were doing okay. Luckily, our Academy staff had already worked remotely um, for quite a while. So that was not any kind of a stress factor. But our fancy had been planned. It was going to be in um, Indianapolis and plans were underway. And we were going to have um, a lot going on at the raceway and plans were pretty exciting. And then we had to pull back and put together a fancy that was totally virtual. And that was done in about four months, maybe five months, something like that. So 
all in all, it was it was totally my honor to be there for our members and to help everybody stay connected, share information, keep the staff and the members and the board, everybody joined. And um, it it was not what I expected, but I have to say my whole career was not quite what I expected. And I found it um, very fulfilling. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I would say that uh, when we went to Fency in Orlando and got to see you walk on stage, it kind of made, it made me say like, oh my God, like how far have we come? Because you were there and, you know, your, your presidency has basically been virtual. <laughs> so it was good to see you on stage and it totally, it to I mean, it was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I know, it was you know. Yeah. And it, it was um, it was so, so wonderful that Ellen was so generous in allowing Kevin and I to be on stage with her. And when yes. we got there in person, I I didn't realize how many people felt like we kind of lost that tradition of the presidents being on stage. So um, Ellen was incredibly generous to allow Kevin and I, and it was fun for us to all be up there with Pat um, to welcome everyone. And I, I feel yeah. like it came full circle again. And I received wonderful comments about people really happy to see that. And it was fun for me as well. Yeah, yeah it was awesome to see. So it was, uh, you know, like I said, it was a very touching moment because it made, it was like, oh my God, like, look how, far time has passed and we're it's like you know here we are we're, we're ex everyone's excited to be there and it's like oh my god yeah you and kevin yeah i mean the virtual time with the virtual fun, right <laughs> yes yes oh yes, boy yes. Well, but, thanks for seeing that angel that's that's sweet yeah no no it was it was lovely it was great to see um so next question for you um and i know your journey has been unique if you could do it all over again in your career what would you change and, and what would you keep the same? What would you say? Uh, good question. Um, I think if, I think I would have liked to have gone on and gotten a master's degree in um, communications, in media skills, in, in um, PR and marketing because I feel like that's where dietitians and NDTRs are lacking. We have the knowledge, we have the expertise, but if we can't communicate that to stakeholders and people that are gonna hire us and legislators who are gonna write us into laws, then um, we're missing the boat. And what I learned in private practice is that maybe 40% of the time I'm worried about my skills and the best materials and education of my patients. 60% is marketing and keeping those clients in the door and marketing to the doctors. And you can't just market or um, do PR activities once or twice. You have to keep it going and keep it going. And I had to learn that um, through through connections and my own personal education, so that that's the one piece I think I would I would change. Um, what I wouldn't keep the same, or what I would keep the same, is my path through the various areas of food service and dietetics. I I feel like you miss so much if you only focus on one area. You lose your expertise for one thing. You know, it's real easy, you know, a few months out, a year out, you're not um, qualified anymore. You've lost your, you know, most evidence-based practice. So um, right. I feel like people are limiting their possibilities by just focusing on one area. And um, so I, I say I my different career path. Uh, let's see. Awesome. Well, I know that uh, you, well, I guess maybe you want to, the, the next question would be, what does the future hold for you? I guess I, I know you mentioned, or well, you're in San Antonio. Now you live in Georgia. Tell us about this whole experience yeah. moving to Georgia. <laughs> 
Sure. So before I was elected to Academy president, my husband and I were discussing when can we retire? And my husband was ready to retire much sooner than I was. But um, during COVID, he began to be my office manager um, and helped me with billing and things like that. And so he couldn't retire until I was done with being Academy president and I was done with my okay. private practice. So we negotiated. Um, and decided that we wanted to be sure and retire before we were too old to be able to travel and and do some things that we want to do. So um, December 15th of 22 was the day that I retired from my private practice. But I tell everyone I am not retired from the academy or my profession. So I sold my private practice, which was very exciting. I wasn't sure if I would be able to sell my practice as an asset or if I would have to just transfer my patients. But it was a business at, um, um, benefit to me. It was an asset and I was able to find the perfect person to take on my clients and my physician referrals. And I'm still mentoring her today to be sure that she's um, on top of things. And if she needs any help, I'm there to support her. So over Christmas, we moved to Georgia and I am loving it here. I'm learning to play pickleball and doing a lot of yoga and Pilates. We've got a lake um, about two blocks away. So we're gonna do some sailing and um, life is sweet and I'm enjoying it. And as far as Academy goes, I'm finishing up um, as past president, you're involved with the nominating committee. That ended last year for me. But this year, I'm on the Academy Awards um, and um, Honors and Awards Committee. So I'm doing that. And so um, that is ending at the end of this, this term of office. So um, then I hope to go on um, a speaking um, be available for speaking. Primarily, I think my expertise would be in the leadership areas. Um, I don't feel like my primary expertise is weight management and private practice, GI. I did some diabetes, although I was not a diabetes educator. I did eating disorders, um, but I'm not, you know, since I'm a few months out now, I'm really focusing on leadership. So I'm looking forward to sharing my knowledge and expertise and experiences from Academy leadership with some of our members. Awesome. That's great to hear. It's good to see people still be involved. I think uh, sometimes people might be like, how do people have the time? But um, to volunteer and but, you know, to see people still be involved even after long being involved you know it's uh, i think it's a family it's a big network of people that we we know and friends friendship for life you know so, mm -hmm. so it's a great sure. thing to see and so. and one thing i'm really proud of that i didn't really talk much about was when i was in san antonio in my private practice i did a lot of volunteering with the mayor's fitness council and at the time the way it began is that I was delivering a pack check to one of our Texas senators who was a pharmacist and was very much in support of dietitians being licensed and many of the advocacy efforts at the national level. And so um, her name was Letitia Vandepute. Um, and she was a wonderful supporter of dietitians in San Antonio and throughout Texas. So when I delivered that check to her with some other colleagues, I asked her if there was anything I could do to help her. And she said that she was creating um, a San Antonio committee to work with one of the county commissioners on creating healthier options in restaurants and helping um, subdue the diabetes epidemic and obesity epidemic in San Antonio. At the time we were somewhere between the number one and number three most obese city in the country. So she appointed me to this committee. I made connections um, um, and networking through this committee. And from that committee, the Mayor's Fitness Council was created. So I was the first dietitian 
appointed to the San Antonio Mayor's Fitness Council. From there, me the Metro Health Health Department got involved and they had no dietitians on their staff at the time. So they hired dietitians, more dietitians were hired by Metro Health and more dietitians throughout San Antonio in the schools, in community and public health, in private practice like me, we really um, came on um, and took an active role in the Mayor's Fitness Council. And we made sure that they knew it's not just fitness, it's nutritional health as well. So now any of the, the um, activities that are sanctioned or approved of by the Mayor's Fitness Council in San Antonio must have a nutrition component. So, you know, maybe it's healthy snacks or something like that, along with the fitness program. So I'm very proud of the work that we did. One of the programs that the Healthy Restaurant Initiative was called Por Vida. And then we had um, healthy vending that was created for the, the public offices in San Antonio. And another thing we created on the Mayor's Fitness Council was called Ciclovia which was taken from a program in South America. And what they do is they close down one main street downtown and for half a day and people bring their dogs and bicycles and there's little venues along the way. So dietitians had booths, asked the dietitian and um, um, we were involved in that for many years as well. That was awesome. Well, so yeah, I mean, clearly you've, you've been, you dabbled in everything, anything and everything, <laughs> and yeah. brought a good name to the profession. So thank you. You're welcome. It's okay. You know, I think all of us have a role to play in not only promoting ourselves, but promoting the profession. So when, when we're out there like you, Angel, talking about um, being a media spokesperson or a leader or this podcast, you represent the rest of us. If any of us do media um, on YouTube or anything else, what you say and do represents the rest of us. So we all have to be solid in our evidence-based practice. We have to promote the rest of us as well and be a united force. And to me, the Academy is helping us with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's why we put this out here. We want to make the profession look good. That's, you know, you we want to advertise the strengths of the registered dietitian and the, and the DTRs out there. So, so yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. So thank you. I could, I could chat with you all day. I love, I love everyone I chat with. So I'll just ask you the final question. I want to respect your time, but okay. any words of wisdom for the next generation of dietitians? And I did recently opened up my podcast to other outside of the profession because I feel there's a lot of tangibles that we all can learn from each other but anything you'd like to impart for for young students interns or up-and-coming dietitians um what you have to say? I would say keep an open mind when you're going through your education no matter what it is and don't assume that you're going to go into one particular um expertise area learn a lot um, I would say get experience in a variety of different areas and get some mentorship ask for mentorship no matter how long you're in the profession we all need mentors and we can learn from that and the last thing I'd like to say is um, say yes first Kathy King um, was a mentor of mine when I was in my private practice beginning that and she always told us say yes first and then figure out how to do it and I've always used that as my mantra um, we can figure it out we have so many skills we don't tap into and no matter what your expertise or profession give it a chance and it's okay if you fail you learn from it and you can move on none of us are perfect we all make mistakes and that's a part of life. Change happens and I'd say embrace change and and go for it. Allow yourself the grace of making mistakes. It's going to happen and you'll learn from it and you'll progress and grow. Awesome. Well, with that being said, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. And
Before we end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor. It's me! Your greatest gift if you are watching this on YouTube is to like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and share this content. If you are listening on a podcast platform, please share away. And of course, if you want to buy me a coffee, you can go to buy me a coffee and share a beverage my way. And if you want to purchase one for the guests that I just interviewed, send it my way and I will get it to that individual. Thank you very much for watching and have a great rest of your day.